And I hope everyone's wearing a blue or their blue scarves. Perfect. Okay, as we come together tonight on this night, we recognize all our differences and similarities and all the ways they come. We recognize the land beneath our feet and the energies and materials it provides. We recognize that we need to respect and honor these lands, not work to destroy them. Tonight, we bring this realization forward, highlighting work that has, has and is still being done to the land. We share stories of great ventures and struggles, battles and battling the dangers, the stresses, the never ending fear that has been created. I welcome you tonight to open your eyes, your ears and your minds to what you learn and open your present to the actions that we work on now to prevent the damage that is occurring. With many joining us from around the world tonight, we, we honor all of Mother Earth and Turtle Island. But specifically, this group is located in Toronto gen and general Toronto area. So we want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and the Chippewa bands. With just as much respect to all the lands and treaties across Canada and the world that come together tonight. We also focus in on the land traditional ancestral lands of the Innu of the Inu Netasa Avu and the Inuit of Nunata Avu. We recognize all first peoples who were here before us, those who live with us now and the seven generations to come, as first peoples have done since the time immoral, immemorial. Immemorial, sorry. We strive to be responsible stewards of the land and to respect the cultures, ceremonies, and traditions of all who call it home. As we open our hearts and minds to the past, we commit ourselves to working in a spirit of truth to make a better future for all. As we ground ourselves on stories that hold on and open our hands to the act and protect we come together to share and honor, hold, and rebuild, learn and discover from all the experiences and gifts the land clutches to survive with. I now welcome Pastor Bob Holmes to enlighten participants of this movement tonight that brings you this event and, ever, and that brings everyone together for the same goal, peace both with the land and each other. Bob. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, and uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Blue Scarf Earth Day celebration. And I'm just going to introduce a little bit about the Blue Scarf. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm going to play a little bit here. It's an Afghan peace volunteer uh, group. And uh, we just have to get rid of this. And it began in Afghanistan with these wonderful people you see on the screen there. And uh, they're young people, youth, and they've lived under a war forever and ever. And they've come together and they, the blue scarf is, is their mark. And uh, I want to introduce to you um, 
is Arguna. She's the lady in the front here, the young woman. And notice the scarves say border free in English and also in Dari. And that's really important. And I asked her, what does all that mean? And so she told us that, well, we have some really important things. Look on her hand there, it says enough. And so she said, enough war. We've grown up with war all our lives. It's been here for generations. So we work for a nonviolent world. And enough inequality. You know, men and women aren't equal here and, and the tribals are fighting all the time. And we work for equality of everybody. We're all equal on this planet. He said, he said, enough global warming, you know, because we're destroying our own planet. So working for a green planet. These are three really major things that they work on. And then I was fortunate enough when I went to visit to meet with um, many of the different people, they have 17 teams all working on various aspects of peace and justice and no war. And, and one of them is the Blue Scarf team. And I asked this lovely young woman here, what does border free mean? And she says, well, all human beings must live free and equal under one blue sky. Wow. And then I had a chance to sit down with Dr. Hakim. He's the founder of the Afghan Peace Volunteers. And he said, you know, we have several building blocks that we build our whole um, program on here. One is becoming a border-free family. We, we're not just Afghanistans living in Kabul. We're connected to everybody on the whole planet Earth. Another one is we believe in self-government, egalitarian self-government. In other words, even though he's the founder, he doesn't run it. The students run it and they listen to each other. And that's really important. Another of the building blocks is they adopt shared values like nonviolence. And these are the values that if you want to join the Afghan peace volunteers and you have to kind of commit to those to start with. Another building block is building cooperative economies. And um, they're upset with the capitalistic system that everybody has to make profit and, and uh, you know, we have to cooperate with each other and have sustainability. And of course, they're working to abolish war. That's, they've lived under war their whole lives. And restoring the relationship with nature is very, very important to them. So here's a picture of them. I met with them for a week there and they told me all kinds of things. Their mission, as they describe it, is to seek and nurture nonviolent relationships and alternative ways of building a green, equal world without war. And so they want that to go worldwide. They want it everywhere on the planet. And they're very good with the media. And uh, they're trying to get a million young people wearing the blue scarves and calling for a green, equal world without war and for nonviolence. And here in Toronto, about six years ago, we picked up the Blue Scarf Movement and we have our walks usually, <laughs> not in the last year, but before we'd walk all through downtown Toronto with these lovely banners. And uh, that was our work. And so that's what, we're, that's what brought us here tonight. So I'm going to introduce to you a wonderful woman, her name is Tamara Lorenz. And she's a PhD student in global governance at Wilfrid Laurier. She was awarded the Rotary International World Peace Fellowship as a senior, re senior researcher for the International Peace Bureau in Switzerland. She's currently on the International Board of the Global Network Against Nuclear Power and Weapons in Space. Tamara has a law degree and a business management degree specializing in environmental law and management, which she got from Dalhousie University. And among her many research interests are the military's impact on the environment and climate change. She's also interested in the intersection of security and peace 
and the Canadian defense and foreign policy and disarmament and resistance to NATO and military sexual violence. So it's my privilege to welcome to our Blue Scarf Earth Day celebration, Tamara Lorenz. Good evening, everyone. It's really nice to be with you all. Happy belated Earth Day. I'm so glad we're all together. Also uh, recognizing the people of Afghanistan wearing our blue scarves. Um, I'm speaking to you from Waterloo, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral peoples along the Grand River. And I too acknowledge and appreciate uh, that it's our indigenous peoples who are on the front lines protecting and defending our land, air and water. And tonight we're going to be hearing about the Innu struggle to protect their land, air and water. I'm going to just give you a brief uh, uh, overview and I'm going to share some slides with you now. So one of the main motivations for our event this evening is to raise awareness about the fact that the Canadian government is planning on buying 88 new fighter jets at a cost of uh, $77 billion. And we want to show how fighter jets, wars and militarism have an adverse impact on people and on the earth, especially for our indigenous communities. And, and then later this evening, uh, you will hear how to get involved in our campaign to uh, stop this defense procurement by our new peace campaigner, uh, Lane McCrory. So I'm going to, um, I, I am so thrilled that we are with the authors of these uh, two new books, Bob Bartel, Natui's Cap, and Elizabeth Penishu. I have trouble uh, saying her her name in in her Inu language, Inu uh, Ayman, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing both of them share about the struggle that the Inu experience trying to stop the Royal Canadian Air Force and NATO uh, testing fighter jets in their territory. I have bought the books and I have read them. They're excellent, very important. I encourage you to get a copy as well. You can buy these books and support uh, independent indigenous bookstores, good minds, and uh, strong nations. The our our uh, our peace history is so important for us to know, and there is uh, a connection between the struggles uh, in the past and our struggles today. So uh, you're going to hear more about these books uh, after my presentation. So I'd like to show you this uh, map of the Inu land in, in uh, Labrador. It's called Natasinan. And um, you can see that the, uh, well, the, the Inu people have, have lived in the territory from, uh, for time immemorial. Uh, protecting the land means protecting Inu, uh, the, the Inu people, their, their language, their traditions, and their culture. Destroying the land is um, is, is, it means destroying the people. This map shows you the, uh, where the arrow is, is where the Royal Canadian Air Force Base, Five Ring Goose Bay is located. And then the gray zones there is where the low level flight testing uh, has been held and also where the, the uh, bombing of uh, the bombing tests uh, have also taken place. And not only is the territory, this Inu territory, been militarized. It's also been very much industrialized. So this is a map that shows you some of the mega dams, the Muskrat Falls and Churchill Falls, as well as um, massive uh, mines and pits, such as the iron ore mine by the Iron Ore a Company of Canada, as well as Rio Tinto. The Inu were not consulted and uh, very much opposed these developments. Their, uh, uh, their communities have also not adequately benefited from this resource extraction. And many of the highways and the rail lines uh, really helped 
uh, didn't help so much the people, but, but to extract the resources uh, from this territory. So now let's go back and talk about, about uh, militarism in the territory. So in 1941, uh, during the Second World War, the government of Canada and the United States decided to, to build a military air base uh, at Goose Bay. Um, the, bay, the base was used as a transit for men and materiel and fighter jets going to the theater in Europe. The base should have been returned to the Innu after the war, but instead it's remained controlled by the Canadian government and the military. Today, the base is used by the Canadian Armed Forces, by NATO allies, and by NORAD for ongoing operations and for training exercises. And the records show, if you look at the federal contaminated sites inventory, as well as environmental assessments, that the base and the uh, surrounding area is highly contaminated by hydrocarbons. And this is primarily because of the petroleum that has been used from the fighter jets. In the late 1970s, uh, NATO and Canada started to do low level uh, flight testing in, in this area. Uh, this is a picture that shows you how low the fighter jets fly just above the tree line. And they are extremely loud and they contaminate the air shed and they terrorize the people and they terrorize the animals. Um, NATO could not conduct these kinds of low level flight testing in Europe because of the public backlash and also because of the density. So you know, they decided to, to use this territory and they, they, you know, they unjustly and unfairly uh, considered this land uh, empty. Um, and uh, the, the bombing uh, practices caused craters in the earth and as well like burnt trees and the forest, it's absolutely terrible. In the mid 1980s, the Innu people um, began a major coordinated campaign of nonviolent resistance. They occupied the they occupied the runways at the base. They occupied the bombing practice uh, sites out in the range. They marched to Ottawa. They they protested and occupied the headquarters of the Department of National Defense. They uh, spoke about their struggle across Canada in the United States and across uh, Europe. They also filed legal injunctions. They refused English translations in court. They went on hunger strike and they did many other actions. And what the Canadian government did is they arrested the Innu people and their supporters. They charged them with trespassing and they imprisoned them many times. Uh, they uh, spent you know weeks and months in jail i mean just think about the injustice of that and, you know this is their territory and the canadian government uh, put them in jail trying to protect their land and their culture the canadian voice of women for peace was very much involved in this struggle as well the picture uh, that you see here is inside one of the 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 inu tents in the land and the arrow is pointing to Betty Peterson, a matriarch in the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. She was a longtime peace activist and also very much involved in the women's movement and in the Indigenous struggles in the country. Uh, she lived until 100 years old and was very, very active uh, even into her 90s and she just died three years ago. And it's so nice to see her. Um, Betty is has a there's a picture that Elizabeth put of Betty um, in her book. This is taken from the book. Now I, I haven't had very much time to tell you about this uh, amazing struggle uh, by the Innu people, but there's an excellent documentary that I encourage you to watch. It was uh, done in 1991, uh, 30 years ago, by the National Film Board of Canada. It's called Hunters and Bombers. You can watch it on YouTube, and it's only uh, 50 minutes. One of the meetings uh, uh, that the Innu uh, held about protesting these low level flights that were happening by the fighter jets, they put up this sign, no negotiations while the bombs still fall, stop NATO. 
Um, we, we need to stop NATO today because NATO is one of the prime reasons why Canada is buying these fighter jets. Uh, two years ago, the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, we organized a campaign, Feminists Against Militarism, Women Say No to NATO. We are very much opposed to this nuclear armed military alliance that is involved in illegal occupations and wars um, in in the, in the Middle East and, uh, and, and in North Africa, like in Libya, and, and is involved right now. Canada has soldiers in Latvia dangerously provoking, uh, provoking Russia. So we want to get Canada out of NATO. We want to delegitimize NATO. We want to um, also uh, abolish NATO, no to NATO. Um, and then I just want to bring to your attention very quickly before we hear from our authors that tomorrow is an inaugural youth summit against NATO and it's going to be featuring our very own national coordinator Vanessa Lang Tang. Uh, she's also going to be speaking um, with alongside youth activists from Germany, Netherlands and the United Kingdom. So we hope that you will uh, work with us to get Canada out of NATO, to help us stop Canada buying new fighter jets and from moving the money from militarism into investing in our uh, First Nations communities into a, a green economy, into a a, a, a red new deal and a green new deal. These are the things that we need. So uh, thank you very much. And now I'm going to turn the floor back over to Melissa. Thanks. And I hand it back to Mary Ellen to introduce um, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you very much, Tamara, for your very uh, detailed and, and moving description of the, the history and, and the struggle. So I have the great privilege of introducing uh, Chowquesh Elizabeth Panashwe. Um, and it, it is a great pleasure to be seeing you here this evening, Elizabeth. It was a long process to make connection with you and to finally make it possible for you to be here tonight. Uh, Elizabeth is an elder of the Innu Nation. And um, Tamara gave some pictures of the protests and the struggles uh, on the Innu land, but there were many other pictures that actually showed Elizabeth's leadership so her face and uh, her name first became familiar to many Canadians in the 1980s and 90s during those protests which she often was organizing, protests against the, uh, the NATO fighter jets. And as Tamara described, the training flights of those jets over Innu land over her beloved Innu land. And as Tamara showed those jets, just how low they flew. And the fact that, I mean, the Inno didn't know this was going to happen. They were never consulted. And they also did not know that these planes would also be practicing the dropping of bombs. So these were tremendous shocks and the Innu people had always been very quiet, but this was really too much. And Elizabeth had the, the gifts and the passion to stand up and speak out and say, just like the young uh, Blue Scarf volunteers, enough. Elizabeth's love for and oneness with the land is deep and passionate. She's the mother of 10 children and at least 29 grandchildren. And she thinks constantly of how she can protect this land for her children and grandchildren. She has been and is a tireless activist and a powerful speaker 
who has traveled throughout Canada and beyond to Europe and to share the plea of the Innu people to be heard in their urgent call for protection and respect of their land. I think Elizabeth would agree, and it certainly comes through in her book, that her motto seems to be, I never give up. I'm sure there are times, Elizabeth, when you have felt like giving up, but ultimately you have never given up and you still are not giving up and you're being here this evening to speak to us yet again is a, a real testimony to that. So we'd like to invite you now to, in your own words, tell us what it was like for you and your people as those jets started flying over your land. Go, oh, go. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I remember, I don't know how many years ago, when we, when we went in the bush in a country, uh, uh, the people hunting in the bush in a country and all this family, like uh, my husband, my grandchildren and my children. And it's not only just me, all Inu people, she had just go no to meet in the country hunting. And thousand, thousand years Inu people hunting Labrador. Mm -hmm. And that's why, that's why I went to protest. I went in jail. I didn't give up. I want to help. I want to help my people. I want to help the children. I want to help protect everything, animals and uh, people when you go in the bush in a country, all people go no to meet. No to meet means in the in the country. Everybody go no to meet uh, with all this family, old people and this small babies. And uh, it's very scary, I remember that, very, very scary, the jets coming. Mm -hmm. And there's a big noise. My, uh, my English got problem. Every, everybody heard the plane coming, uh, passengers plane, you can hear far away coming. But this jets is not the same. Not the same. There's a big noise and very low. All of a sudden. What? Can you see that? The noise is all of a sudden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You only hear it when the jets are right above you. You don't hear them coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I asked Camille to help me because my English is not very good. Oh, some, it is good. Some, some stuff, I don't know how to, to say that. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, when you know people go no to meet in the country, always hunting, always, every day, men are hunting. And the children, he couldn't play outside, scared, scared the noise. Mm -hmm. Like me when I was young, always I play outside with my brothers and my sisters. Mm -hmm. I play outside, I never heard nothing. Wow. Now, that time when I went to uh, the kids, the children, he couldn't go far away. She got to be stay close to the tent, close to the parents. It's very, very, very scary. Mm -hmm. Same thing, animals, animals everywhere in the woods, the water, beaver and the water, all kind of animals. And a calibo, black bear in the woods, animals everywhere. And I remember animals, she couldn't stay one place, I always run away, run away. And spring, spring uh, animals, she, she got a baby, she got a baby in the stomach. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what happened to the baby in the stomach because. Uh, Calibo always nervous. She couldn't stay one place. I always run, run away, try to run away. 
Mm -hmm. It's never happened long time ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us when you went out on the land and when you first uh, became aware of what had happened when the bombs dropped? What was that uh, like? Is that time, Bamary? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I went to the Bamary Range, there was a, a three women and two men, five of us. We walk, go to the Bamary Range, and we put the tent there, stay there. And I was very, I was very shocked when I see that. I never see, I never see my life like that. I went to I went in a country when I was young with my parents. I never see that stuff like that. The jets, what you call small planes? Jets? Jets, yeah. Yeah, jets put a, a bombs in the bush in the country. Bombs everywhere in the water and uh, drums, the gas drums. I seen everywhere in, in the water and and a big a bombs and I just I was very sad when I see that I was very shocked I never never see that in my life mm -hmm. my parents he went hunting everywhere you know people when he go no me in the country we never stay one place I always move around move around ways animals because we eat all kind of animals mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes I was uh, that uh, when I stayed together women's we cry when I talk about that very sad this is our land that is in land why like that uh, what you call uh, the um, uh, flying uh, practice, practice uh, the land, can you think? Yes, they were training, fun. they were practicing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, practice, yeah. And I can see all the trees dead, a big, big hole. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the bombs went like this and the trees all dead and under the water on the lake. I seen that, yeah. three women and to a man. Yeah. It's very, very dangerous. I was so, I was so scared. That's why I, I didn't want to give up a protest. And then I talk uh, many, many places to share the story what happened in Labrador. Mm -hmm. People very uh, nervous, a big noise. Yeah. What you call that noise, Camille? Sonic boom? Yeah. She, she heard you. The, she's talking about sonic booms, I think. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hard to imagine. It's hard for us to imagine that, you know, as how loud that was and how frightening it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth, I have, as you tell your story now and in your book, I feel how that land is almost like part of you or you are part of that land. So when you saw it burnt like that and so broken, it was like it broke your heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I cry many times. We sat down together like, you know, women. What are we gonna do? Yeah. This is how it went, what happened. Yeah. Very sad and very scared when we go to because we didn't stay in the house when I go to the meeting in the country. We used the tent. Yeah. And uh, when the noise came in, everybody, everybody very nervous, young, young people and old people. Yes. And when you when you protest there out on the uh, the runways at the base, when you protested and you said this is our land, did you feel those those 
airplane pilots were understanding you? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm were they listening to you? Did they listen to you? I think the pilots were thinking when they were flying, like, were they thinking about the Innu or, or do you think they thought about what the Innu were feeling about the flights? Uh, what do you think the military was thinking? I think the military, uh, he don't understand. No. He know people, he know people there. Like, you know, people where I'm from, Labrador, I wouldn't be here all my life. If, if I died, and then the children, my grandchildren, my great great children, always the people he's going to be here. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he, he understand, you know, people very respect the land mm -hmm. and water and animals, everything. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So Elizabeth, did you choose a piece from your book? Would you be able to have uh, Camille read a piece from your book? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Thank you. So John wanted me to uh, read a section that is about when they went on the bombing range when on the bombing range to protest mm -hmm. so she talked about it a little bit earlier and um anyway i'll just uh, go right into it um so it's the night before and uh her and uh a couple of the other women have planned to go the next day i didn't sleep very well I was afraid Noosh and Manny May were going to change their minds. I prayed before I went to bed, please God help me, don't let them change their minds. I got up early and put things in my backpack, my coat, my radio, tea bags and bread, milk, sugar and a teapot. And I just got ready to go and headed to the airport. I was so relieved when I saw Noosh and Manny May there. When the pilot found out we were going to come, he put a map on the table and showed us how far we'd have to walk. He said, I'm only allowed to take the two men and the doctor inside the bombing range because they have work to do. He made me even more nervous than I already was, but then Manny May and Nush said, that's okay, we're still going to go. I was afraid they'd change their minds when he said we'd have to walk, but they didn't. I was still worried about them though, my sister smokes too much and Manny May has diabetes, so she needs special food. We walked and walked. It took us almost all day and there were swarms of flies. Finally, we got to a low hill where there had been a forest fire and the trees hadn't grown back yet, so we could see a long way. I could see a tent in the distance and then I saw a military helicopter close to the tent. Maybe the military decided to send their own doctor and they wanted to get there before our doctor arrived. Noosh and Manny May speak good English so they can talk to the Akanishal. When they saw the helicopter, Manny May said, this makes me so angry. If I catch that helicopter pilot, I'm going to say, why did I have to walk here from so far away when you could just fly in? What gave you the right? It's our land, you have no right to be here. I was thinking, this is great. We're going to be such, we're, you're going to be such a strong woman. We kept walking, but by the time we got there, the helicopter had already left. So Manny May didn't get a chance to tell the pilot what she thought. Manny Aten had made bread and cooked a goose for us. I told her about our long walk and how tired and hungry we were. The priest was very happy when he saw us. He was emaciated, very, very skinny. Many attend said, let's go outside to eat so he doesn't have to watch us. We spread the tablecloth out on the ground and got ready to eat. But then the priest came out leaning on a stick. He said, go ahead and eat. Don't worry about me. I just want to be here with you. It was very hard to eat with him there watching us. We decided to wait until morning to walk around the bombing range and see what was going on. We were so tired, we went straight to bed. The next morning, we went to have a look. 
There were fuel drums all around the shore and the bombs had left huge craters in the ground, longer than an adult person and deep enough to stand up in. It's a wasteland. Mm -hmm. It looks as though a giant bulldozer dug it all up. All the trees and plants are dead. There's nothing left for the animals to eat. It broke my heart. I'm sure my sister and Manny May and I were all thinking the same thing. This used to be such a beautiful place. There must be a lot of animals around, black bear, beaver. How do they feel? The beaver lives in the water and the fuel drums are all around the lake. We went back to the tent and talked about what to do. I said, I don't trust them anymore. The government told us there would only be little test bombs, not real bombs, but they're huge. We have to tell everybody what the military has done. We have to do something to stop it. Okay, I, I will thank you very, very much. Your book and yourself, Elizabeth, alive for us. And I can say for myself, because I'm reading your book, that I, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm really with you in this struggle. And I agree with you. Oh, yeah. uh, John Wish wanted to talk about another um, point that she wanted to make. Okay, just a short. Uh, I, I forgot about uh, Lola flying and it's uh, a pollution on the ground. Mm. And uh, animals everywhere. I don't know what happened to animals. And uh, everywhere, you no know medicine. You know, people use, you know, medicine when you go in the bush in the country, when the baby's sick, when uh, people sick, and we use, you know, medicine. And, uh, and the planes everywhere, pollution everywhere. Mm. Very, I was very, very sad. I was very worried. And yeah. sometimes I said many times, why the government, he did that our land? Mm -hmm. This is our land. Yeah. Thousand, thousand years, you know, people hunting. Why? She should respect Inu people. Yeah. The government, she should respect Inu people here hunting. Yes. Like, I'm gone. My grandchildren, she's going to go hunting mm -hmm. and the children. Yes. Just like a generation, generation, generation. That's right. Thank you very much. We hear you. We hear you. And we're so grateful that you're here to tell us yourself what has happened. And uh, we certainly don't want that to happen anymore. So we're going to invite Bob Bartell to come and just uh, tell us about his book. And, and uh, we ask you to just continue listening here with us. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Yes, thank you. That was beautiful and heart. heart fun. Um, so the next book is Notori's Cap um, by Bob Bertel. Uh, so children should be the first ones to live in peace, to have peace, to, give, to be given peace. But when adult actions don't respect this, it can be confusing and cause rippling actions within a community. And the children are now losing their sense of grounding and peace. I welcome next the author Bob Bartell of Nutawi's Cap, which puts a children's perspective on the impact of the fighter jets and more into our theme tonight. Bob Bartell uprooted his family twice to spend three year terms with with the Mennonite Central Committee, a global relief development and justice organization in Jamaica and Labrador. These experiences were life-changing. Bob now lives, writes, and gardens in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan with his wife, Dorothy. Thank you for joining us and publishing this experience. Can you please share some of it and share the inspiration behind the story, Bob? If he is here, if he didn't make it, we have a clip to share. which I don't think he, unfortunately. Let's 
So unfortunately, it doesn't look like uh, Bob. Unfortunately, Bob, Bob is here. He just needs oh. to unmute himself. I didn't see the name. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, Bob, you just need to unmute yourself. I'm sorry, Bob. I'm having trouble unmuting you. Let's, uh, I can't find your name on the list. It's Dorothy. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Now you should be able to unmute, Bob. Sorry about that. We didn't realize that was you. Try again. He's having trouble unmuting himself again. Hi. <laughs> good to see, it's good to see some, some uh, old friends, Camille and Shakesh and Robert Holmes. All of these are people I knew from protest days and days when I spent with Christian peacemaker teams. Uh, so, uh, so these are old friends. So, so you wanted to know the book is called Nudawi's Cap and uh, without Camille, Yard, this book probably would not have happened. I uh, wrote a little bit about uh, 300 words and then she, she decided that this would be good for the children in school. So now it's in three languages, two Inu dialects. So, uh, so plus the English is in the middle. And it's uh, also got a famous uh, Inu illustrator, uh, Shakesh's daughter-in-law, uh, Marianne Panashaway. And uh, you, the illustrations in here are very, very, very good. So um, this is produced by Running the Goat Press. And, uh, and it's there. We, I spent three years there and I got to know the Inu. And I, uh, I was mainly the photograph person. So if you go to, to my website, www.bobbartel.com, you'll be able to find a lot of photographs that, that I took of the protests and, uh, and uh, the, time, the time there. Um, yes, so I find that the Inu taught me lots of things. I, I was the one that learned. They wouldn't allow me on the runways, but uh, I got I, they finally arrested me for aiding and abetting, driving a vehicle full of Inu protesters to uh, to the protest site. So, did you want me to read now, or? Yes, please share uh, whatever part you feel is most uh, significant to share. Please, thank you. Can I go wish fishing with you, Nuta? Can I? I scrambled for the fishing gear, the hook and line wrapped around a carnation milk tin. We've been here two months and it's my turn to catch in the mesh. You're 10 years old, Nanas, Nadawi said, it's time. Every Inu needs to learn to fish. I bounced on the fir boughs that made up the tent's floor, then pulled Nudawi through the doorway. Nudawi grabbed his well-worn blue Inu Nation ball cap 
on the way out. The Inu flag on the front showed the world where he belonged. Bring my hand in his strong grip, I skipped to Nadawi's favorite fishing spot where shallow water curled around rocks and wind blew away black flies. Sitting on a large rock at river's edge, Nadawi taught, taught me to bait the hook, cast the line and bring it in. And the mesh soon took the bait. Hang on, bring it in slowly, Nadawi encouraged. Then the mesh fought hard, but we reeled it in. I wanted to run and tell Nikawi and Newcomb right away. First, you must give thanks to Missinak, the water spirit, for giving us the Nimesh, Nadawi said. After giving thanks, Nadawi and I hooked the slippery Nimesh to a stick and carried it to camp. You're not getting away, I said. You're invited for supper. Nadawi laughed. Look what I got, Nika, I shouted, entering the tent. It's an enormous Nimesh, Nadawi said. Proud as she and Nukum prepared our meal. I guess we'll be having a mesh in the Kishikan. The family sat around the crackling campfire. The smells of frying fish and burning wood filled the air. It was my Nimesh, so I ate extra. It tasted delicious. Nukum told, stor told stories of her land we called Nadesman. The Dawi spoke of mesh, nishk, and especially a teak. At Tika's caribou. Without warning, a deafening boom above us drove us to the ground. Even the Dowie, I heard my heart pound hard against my chest. Seconds later, another ear splitting blast struck us. I screamed and ran to hide in the tent. Nakawi and the Nukum ran after me. It's the Jets, Nakawi said, holding me tight, her eyes showing her fear. They were so low, I said. They almost touched the trees. The animals must be afraid too. What if we were in a canoe, Nagawi worried. I looked at Nagawi. He was muttering, his fists clenched tightly. This isn't right, Nagawi said. The government won't listen. They want jets to practice bombing over our land. This campsite in Menanipi is inside their bombing range. Talking to them is useless. These flights will continue. It isn't safe here. We're packing up. We broke camp and headed back to our village, Cheshishi. Nadawi called a meeting of all the new elders. And after the meeting, Nadawi came home. His face was serious. What did you decide? I asked him. Canada is not listening to us. We will walk on the airport runway so the jets will not fly, Nadawi said. Can I come too? I asked. The young and the old must all walk, Nadawi said. We must protect our future, our land and animals. When the time came, whole families, old and young, including me, walked through gates and crawled through over metal fences. We grounded the jets. People took it, took us off the runway and police took us off the runway and buses, but we came back. Again and again we gathered, walked on the runways and stopped the jets. One day, they knew our family and friends set up a protest camp at the end of the runway and asked Uncle Enoch is cutting trees for the tent posts and gathering boughs, the Dowie said. Bring boughs to the floor. I'll set up the canvas tent. In the center of the tent, the Dowie put a wood stove to cook and keep the tent toasty warm. Nukum showed me how to weave boughs for the floor. We picked blueberries here before they built the airport, she said. After we pitched our tents, the police came and said, be careful. The army rolled razor wire behind the wooden fence. Children could cut themselves. My friends and I went to the tall wooden fence to see the razor wire. We peered between the planks. The razor wire stretched across the entire length of the fence. The sun flashing off razor tips frightened me. My people will find a way, I said softly. Next morning, Uncle Enoch and his friends pulled boards off the fence and placed them over the razor wire, making it safe to cross. The elders, mothers, fathers, and families walked through the hole in the fence, over the boards, and safely onto the runway. I held my Aunt Puna's hand. 
as we carefully stepped across the boards. And you were smart and brave, aren't we? I said, and Puna smiled and nodded. As we walked on the runway, military buses rushed to meet us. The buses braked. The police got off and ushered us on board. You are trespassing. This is Canadian military property, the, military, the policeman shouted. This is Natessanen, our homeland, the Dowie reminded him. I followed my aunt onto the bus and looked the bus driver into the eye. This is the Innu land, not yours, but I'm glad you came. My feet are tired. We walk such a long way on this runway. Everyone laughed, even the bus driver. The buses brought us back to the runway camp. That evening, Anukum told me about her long canoe trips through Natessanen. Police cars and buses roared to the camp's edge. The police were angry and loud. We crawled out of the tent. Frightened, I found a Dowie's hand. The police barked names of the leaders. As they walked to the front, the men and women were handcuffed. Nadawi's name was called. Was he your aunt, Nadawi said. Crying, I obeyed and watched the police arrest him. Why are they taking Nadawi away? I was angry and frightened. As officers crammed Nadawi into the police car, his Innu Nation ball cap fell into the dirt. Police sped away. I ran to pick up the cap and brush the dirt off the flag. My aunts, Puna and Manimat, took me home for the night. Aunt Manimat told me the people arrested would be taken to jail far away. We will always keep fighting, she said. The night I slept with Nudawi's cap. I held it close. In my dreams, I was back in the country. I smelled Nudawi, campfires and forests. I smelled a hunter and a fisherman sleeping near me on the fir boughs of our tent, keeping me safe. I could hear the river. Be strong, Nandas, the river murmured. Natasanen will always belong to the Innu. This is Elizabeth Panassi. Beautiful artwork. So I don't know, you have any other questions? Uh, thank you, that was beautiful. I love that story and the images are so, so beautiful. Um, so next we're going into a few more stories um, of, some, of some people who do some actions around this. So next I welcome Phyllis Creighton a VOW member as well as a Plowshares member that got her involved in the actions and inspired by locals to do more while she was there. She shared sleeping quarters with Elizabeth and so many stories that I welcome her here tonight to share some of those adventures. Phyllis? I was really lucky. I was introduced to the whole issue by a conference with Project Plowshares in, in 1988. And I met some Atlantic peace activists, including the one shown in your picture, Elizabeth. And so I was invited to come and spend a weekend in camp. And it was a fantastic experience because I got to sit in that tent and listen to Inu talking about their experience and to see the beautiful land and to understand what a cruel and utterly unacceptable practice it was for Canada to be using the Inu's own land, the bombing range, in order to create mayhem in their territories, to frighten the animals, to scare the children. So I went out and began my activism. And I remember getting raging grannies to sing out on the steps of Parliament. They came from Ottawa and from Montreal and from Toronto. And we sang in the streets of Toronto. And the purpose of that was to get press attention, to get it in magazines and on television stations. I remember when the Inu were on trial 
in Toronto in the courthouse. I went and sang on the steps. It was Human Rights Day, and they were on trial for occupying their own land. And of course, I was able to get some TV coverage before the police showed me off. And what you have to do with an issue like this is make sure all the groups you're a part of know about it, put it in their newsletters, that you make friends with the press, that you get your church involved. When I came back from Natasnan, I got my church, the Anakin Church, to write a letter to the government of protest against this violation of the, the lands and the people's rights on them. After all, they've lived, it's thought, about 15,000 years on that land. Us newcomers, well, my ancestors came here in, in the mid 1840s. We're mere beginners. And that's what's important to understand. You will get people's sympathy. You will connect, tell them to connect with the press, connect with their church, and connect with all their groups and spread the word. That's what it's all about. And I valued very much when Elizabeth came to Toronto and walked with us in some of our demonstrations. We had a campaign called the International Campaign for the Inu and the Earth, which was founded in 1992. And uh, plowshares and science for peace were part of it. And uh, that's what an activist does. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, next, we welcome uh, Brent Patterson, who is a political activist and writer. We welcome him tonight on his coverage on this issue and the work he is doing within these activist communities. Welcome, Brent. There we go. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, well, let me let me really just take a moment to thank. Uh, Chakesh and 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 Bob and and Phyllis for for sharing these stories and documenting them in in books. It's really so incredibly important, I think, to um, to be to be able to share these these stories. They're they're so important. And and I guess I just I just wanted to add a little bit in terms of of of. Um, what we've seen in terms of the militarization of indigenous territories in in this country. Sorry, let me start as well by saying I'm speaking from from Ottawa, from the um, unceded, unsurrendered territories of the Algonquin uh, people. Um, and so, just when we think about about militarization of of territory, to connect it into into other struggles that we've seen, for instance. Um, uh, we can think in terms of the displacement of the of the Stony Point uh, First Nation in Ontario for a military base, and we may not necessarily connect that or think of think of that, but that was um, you know in the 1990s uh, is is what um, um, when Indigenous land defenders. Uh, moved back onto that territory that that was being used as a military base that's that's part of the story in terms of the death the killing by the Ontario Provincial Police of of Anthony Dudley George was was his effort his people's efforts to reclaim their ancestral lands their territory from a military base that had uh, from the lands that had been expropriated uh, from them also just to note too, as we talk about the purchase of these new uh, fighter jets, these new uh, warplanes by by Canada, to 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 kind of situate it as well that that one of the major bases uh, for those fighter jets will be uh, in Cold Lake, which is on uh, uh, in Alberta, which is on uh, Dene lands there, and to remember that that the lands, the territory where, where that base is, that those were forcibly uh, expropriated from the, from the Dene uh, people, um, uh, forcibly moved from those, uh, from those lands. Um, and initially there were sort of promises that, that the base would only be there for 
uh, for 20 years, but clearly it's uh, still there uh, many years later. They were expropriated in the early 1950s. Um, and in the early 2000s, uh, in some ways similar to, to the stories that we've heard about um, Inu resistance, there was Dene resistance to, uh, to the Cold Lake um, Air Base. And so there was a blockade of the base and, and, and um, uh, land defenders trying to, to make their way out onto the land to disrupt the, the operations uh, of, of the base. And so again, a really important story to, uh, uh, to tell and I'd encourage all of us to, um, to dig more into to that story. And I think maybe one of the most moving things that I heard around that particular um, you know, a story was uh, Brian Granbois, uh, 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 a Dene land defender who has since uh, passed on, um, but who was a part of the blockade of, of the Cold Lake uh, Air Base, um, spoke very movingly um, about the bombing range uh, that was there on, on Dene lands and saying where the, the jet fighters were flying past and and dropping um, bombs was on the burial grounds of his great 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 grandfather, and so again, I think you know it's just something for us to think about and and feel. I think when when um, to remember when when we're talking about uh, militarization of territory, displacement of indigenous peoples, and what these military bases really uh, really mean. Um, just quickly to kind of wrap up, the, uh, the other thing that I just wanted to, to add to was um, what, as, as when we sort of look at this planned purchase of these new fighter jets, first of all, there's something like $9 million being put into that, that Cold Lake um, air base on, on uh, territory that uh, or where people were displaced from $9 million dollars. Uh, for new hangars, new infrastructure for those fighter jets to be in it. And again, it's billions that are being put into the fighter jets, but even $9 million is an incredible amount of money that we can think about being spent in, um, in much better ways. Another uh, place where um, the new fighter jets um, uh, could be deployed or could be based is in a proposed uh, forward operating location in a Kaluit, uh, in Nunavut. And, and I think this is also part of this broader picture of the militarization of the Northern territories in this country, both through uh, the planned purchase of these new fighter jets and of the, of the warships. And it's, it's in a context of, of climate change where Canada and, and other NATO NORAD uh, countries seeing rather than really sort of meaningfully addressing the issue of the climate crisis and, and climate change and the melting of the, of the Arctic and the, and, and um, uh, which is allowing for, for more uh, marine traffic, ship traffic, uh, um, resource extraction from 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 the north. There's a sense of of Russia and China having a a, a presence uh, in in the north, and so Canada uh, is just to kind of quote is looking at how to project force. That's what they say: how to project force into the north, and so that's in part in terms of. Of basing these these fighter jets in in a Kaluit, which again leads to a a, a further um, um, militarization of territory, and I might just sort of close out by saying, just in terms of other things to add into this, when we think about this issue, I would suggest it's also important um, that when that we that we connect it to the militarization of of territory to enable. Uh, resource extraction or major extractive mega projects. And in this instance, I'm thinking of what we're seeing with the Wisuatin uh, territory in British Columbia, and the, the militarized RCMP presence uh, there to enable the construction of a fracked gas pipeline on Wisuatin territory without their free prior informed 
uh, uh, consent. And so just connecting um, um, resource extraction and and uh, the deployment of fighter jets and and so forth. Uh, and maybe just uh, lastly, because lots of other great things sort of coming up. I just wanted to sort of remember too that you may be familiar with um, uh, an indigenous Lenka land defender, Berta Caceres from uh, from Honduras, who uh, was assassinated five years ago because of her opposition to uh, a hydroelectric dam on, on her people's uh, territory that was moving ahead without, without um, the consent of the Lenka uh, people. Anyways, about a year before she was killed, she gave this amazing speech uh, in which uh, in which she said about how our mother earth is is poisoned and being poisoned and fenced off and notably she said how our mother mother earth is being militarized and how and how she's calling on us to to take action to to stop this to change this and to build a better world a more sustainable world a more inclusive uh, world for all for all of us and and anyways I just wanted to sort of close with that quote about the importance of taking taking action and um, and uh, pass it on to the next person but but thank you so much I've really enjoyed all the presentations this evening thank you Thank you, Brent. Um, that's perfect uh, lead way into our next section, which is all about action and what we can do um, and how we can make a difference. Um, so I welcome back to Mara first to give us some um, to give us some more actions, and then following her will be the VAO interns um, Ashwini and Lainey to go into what uh, Canadian Voice of Women for Peace is is in, is really interested in doing. Um, so I first welcome to Maribek. Thank you. Uh, it's going to be Lane who's going to uh, let us know about the actions that we can take to stop Canada from buying new fighter jets. And I'll put the links of the of the the ways that you can get engaged in this in the chat as she's speaking. So I'll turn the floor over now to Lane McCrory, who is our new peace campaigner on the no fighter jets. Uh, issue, and she's also working with another new peace campaigner na named Pichasana, who's on the call, as well as another new peace campaigner named uh, Ashwini on disarmament. So, Lane, please take take it away. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tamara. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lane. Um, I am going to pass it to Ashwini first. Um, Ashwini is just going to give us a little bit of um, an introduction. And then I'm going to just go a little bit more in depth into the No New Fighter Jets Coalition and how you all can get involved because we would love to help you. Um, so Ashwini, if you are there, we'd love to hear from you. I'm so sorry, I'm having trouble finding them to unmute them. Um... Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, great. Hi everyone. Nice to see and hear from you all today. My name is Ashwini Salva Kumaran and I'm one of the Peace Campaigner interns specifically working towards disarmament with the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. And I have the privilege of working very closely with the wonderful Tamara and Vanessa and Lane alongside the other interns. And I'm so excited to speak with you all today. I'm coming from Milton, Ontario, which is also known as the land for, of the Mississaugas of the Credit Territory. So I just wanna speak a little bit about disarmament before I pass it over to Lane to get more into the specifics about the No New Fighter Jets campaign. And I think as youth, we all agree that it's really important to get young people involved in disarmament initiatives. As to be quite honest with you all, I only really learned about disarmament and nuclear weaponry and all of these issues when I first joined WOW last summer. And more than ever, I realized it is so important to include disarmament as a political priority, which includes supplying government support for the No New Fighter Jets campaign. I see disarmament as a tool to help prevent armed conflict and to mitigate its impacts when it occurs. According to the United Nations Agenda for Disarmament, these measures are pursued to maintain international peace and security, uphold the principles of humanity, protect civilians, promote sustainable development, and prevent and end armed conflict. So what the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace is doing is we are calling upon the federal government to make disarmament a political priority. 
Not only is there a need to support the current multilateral disarmament institutions, but work together to create a platform which can spearhead regional dialogue on security and arms control. As a young person, I hope the Canadian government can move forward towards a safer world by stepping up as a leader for humanitarian disarmament, which includes saying no to NATO, stopping increased military spending, and the purchasing of new fighter jets. Instead, we should focus on utilizing this money to invest in things like a circular economy, excuse me, promoting Indigenous and sustained healthcare efforts. Ultimately, we are hoping to advocate for Canada to transform the idea of security initiatives, which should be characterized by disarmament in terms of increased collaboration and partnership between the government, international organizations, and civil societies. What I am currently doing is compiling an agenda for disarmament with our asks to the federal government on behalf of WOW, and I encourage you to get involved with our organization if you'd like more information or wish to help. And now to talk more specifically about disarmament in terms of the No New Fighter Jets campaign, I'll pass the floor over to Lane. Thank you so much, Asrini. And um, I want to say once again, hello, everyone. It is great to be with all of you tonight, and thank you for joining us. Um, so as Ashwini said and Tamara said, my name is Lane McCrory and I'm currently coming to you from Jojage, which is colonially known as Montreal. Um, so first of all, first of all, before I start off, I want to just thank Elizabeth and Bob and all the other contributors tonight for your incredible stories. Your passion really inspires me to, to do all of this work. You have been doing this for a long time and as a young person, it's amazing to see how much change you've made in the world alongside everyone. Um, I also think that remembering the blue scarf movement tonight really demonstrates what we're working towards and how it's incredibly interconnected. And we are all stronger when we work together. So I am a peace campaigner with the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, and I work specifically on the No New Fighter Jets campaign. So um, I am also a student at McGill University, and I'm currently studying political science and gender studies. And a lot of my work focuses on like how political actions intersect with different structures of oppression. And um, I think this integrates a lot with what we're seeing in the No New Fighter Jets campaign. So as we heard from our speakers tonight, we heard a lot of stories about how the fighter jets are traumatic and dangerous, and they're dangerous wherever they're used, whether it's in Canada, whether it's abroad, they are really not something that our government should be investing in, and especially not during a pandemic when we could be using the funds for so many other, like so many other um, opportunities. So um, I am also, I'm part of our No New Fighter Jets Coalition. And as Tamara said earlier, we are opposing the Canadian government's purchase of 88 new fighter jets. So the issue really intersects with so many other issues, as you probably can understand from hearing from Elizabeth and Bob tonight, and they really helped to um, encourage us to stop this fighter jet purchase. So currently we are supporting our amazing coalition members as we come to the end of a 14 day fast to stop the fighter jet purchase. Um, specifically, Vanessa Lantang and Brendan Martin have been fasting for nearly 14 days. And um, I think if everybody could give our hearts and our support out to them. They're doing an incredible job. We also have so many coalition members fasting in solidarity with them and really demonstrating the power, again, like I said earlier, of people coming together. Um, so I just did wanna start that. In terms of how you all can get involved, um, thank you all for coming out tonight. It's wonderful to see you here. And we are always looking for help and we're always looking for contributions. So um, I, Tamara, I think, is putting some links in the chat. Um, and Lane, don't forget to mention our, our letter to the Pope. Of course. Um, I do want to highlight a few things. Um, and if the we can post some of the links in the chat as well for you. So a few things that you can do is um, one of the things is the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, also known as VOW. We use both of them, um, we use both of them interchangeably. So if you've been hearing VOW tonight. That is the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. Um, we are gonna be buying copies of the books mentioned here tonight and sending them to the Trudeau government. And so we wanna encourage all of you to do the same from indigenous owned bookstores, um, local bookstores, if you can, that would be fantastic. Um, we also wanna encourage you to contact your MP and, uh, and the prime minister uh, by social media, by email, by letter mail. 
um, to let them know that you oppose the fighter jet purchase. And there is also a link to our action network petition that allows you to send a letter virtually as well. Um, we also, there's another thing that Tamara just mentioned, which is our letter to the Pope. So right now we are appealing to the Pope to pray for um, no new fighter jets. So to pray that the Canadian government doesn't invest in fighter jets. So Justin Trudeau is a Catholic. And so we really want to make sure that we can drive this message home as well. You don't have to be a Catholic to sign the petition. We really wanna make sure that we can build coalitions of all faiths as well. Um, and then for some more information, you can feel free to send us an email. Our email is nofighterjets at gmail.com, which we can also put in the chat. And we can help answer any questions you might have. And we can also um, we can also help you get involved in our campaign. We are always looking for new members. Whether you're part of an organization or not, it would be fantastic to have you. Um, if we have any questions, I think, um, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but if we don't have time for questions, then feel free to send us an email or a private Zoom chat, and then we can get in touch with you as well. Um, if there's anything I missed, feel free to let me know. And I just wanna thank you all again for listening to me tonight and to um, helping us in stopping the fighter jet purchase. You all are doing instrumental work and I can't wait to see what happens next. Perfect, thank you so much to go forth with and um, get, do, get to doing. Uh, um, and uh, I'm going to do our closing, but we will do a comment and a bit of a discussion before we go into our special dance party feature. Um, this, uh, this can end the live Facebook feed, but we can definitely continue a discussion if anyone has any questions. Uh, so it has been, it was such a blessing we could get Elizabeth Penishu tonight with the active season upon us and the great ventures that are about to be had. As we, as we go, we remember that lands beneath us, that the land beneath us as it is we work to keep caring as future generations come to it we work to turn around the destruction and create peace with the lands moving the money to communities being affected not investing in killing innocent lives an innocent life um, with all these actions we have been giving tonight the no fighter just campaign and petitions we can work towards disarmament to prevent more of this damage Posting um, all these, all the links in the chat, we will follow up with through a follow up email, and you can most likely find most of them on social media. Uh, as we go into the night, back into our lives, into the world around us, we remember and take with us these stories of great strength and wisdom bury, bury them in your subconscious to follow you around and to have in your pocket to refer to gain wisdom from and share with others to promote a better land and a, to promote a better land-based future um, thank you very much for participating tonight and i will now welcome any questions um, or comments that people want to bring in to tonight um, and we are now no longer on Facebook uh, <laughs> uh, and yes I will open the floor to some and there is not many comments Oh, I see a hand up. Yes, we have um, Lynn uh, has her hand up. So I'll welcome Lynn to the floor for. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a fantastic <laughs> evening. Thank you to all our speakers and a special thank you to Elizabeth Panashaway. Um, I'm Lynn Adamson and I'm co-chair of Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. But in the 1990s, when Elizabeth and others walked from Windsor to Ottawa as part of the campaign against the fighter jets. Uh, I was uh, privileged to be able to participate at certain points in that walk 
to take part in it and uh, got so much admiration for, for the campaign that you were involved in, Elizabeth. And it inspired me to uh, take um, direct action against the um, air show, the war show in Hamilton and get arrested uh, later at the end of that decade. Um, so thank you very much for the courage that you have put into all your work. And I'm so glad to see you have the opportunity to share with us tonight and also in a book, uh, the stories that people need to hear. And thank you. So it's, it's fantastic to see you again. Thank you, Lynn. It's always good to hear from, hear from you. Uh, does, Elizabeth, does Elizabeth have any um, Paul has his hand up. I will go. Oh. oh, sorry. Tamara? No, oh, I'm here. Yes, I'm Paul, and uh, my wife and I, Janice, live in Sun City Hilton Head in Bluffton, South Carolina. Okay, so we, we've been long many years fighting this in the United States. And just by coincidence, briefly, today we were in Beaufort nearby. And what what would, what did we hear overhead but F-35 fighter jets booming on our heads and everyone just like, nothing is happening and we're putting our Everybody. fingers in our ear. So uh, we're, we're well aware, we're in fact, probably the United States is probably one of the centers for all this militarism around the world. So we're aware of this, we've been doing this now, one of my question is, with the, um, uh, I'm thinking of all the fantastic numbers of indigenous people with all their, their traditions. And, uh, and I know there have been attempts at unifying all this uh, energy and effort. And um, so I'm really trying to learn uh, with, with these efforts to unify, have they been able to crack the indifference really of the Canadian government. Our government is equally uh, very indifferent to what anything we say. I mean, our budget is huge, $753 billion for war. So, all right. So what I'm saying is, is there have been any attempt, have you been able to crack this, this wall of indifference and really the depravity uh, uh, toward the people? Any comments on that? Um. Well, I'm not asking you for, I'm not, I mean, you know, a little bit of a, um, I mean, is there pressure brought to bear? I mean, is there a, like a, uh, I don't know where to start because I'm not Canadian, but uh, so I'm really at a loss, but is, is there, has there been in your estimation, some way to put pressure a pressure point within the Canadian government that would perhaps begin to listen. Brent, um, yes. or, or um, maybe, Tamara, yeah. uh, Paul, thank you so much to you and all of your uh, fellow Americans, uh, peace activists who are working so hard to uh, stop US uh, militarism and wars and just to remind everybody that uh, right now we're in the midst of the global campaign against military spending this is a movement that's led by the international peace bureau and in the chat i put a link for you to sign the appeal to call on the governments of the world to reduce military spending which is now at 1.9 trillion dollars we really need to move that money uh, to invest in our urgent social and environmental needs but um uh, uh, Paul, just to quickly uh, respond to your question that in, in, in this country, we have been mobilizing for the last year to try to stop Canada from buying new fighter jets. Uh, right now, there are three, the, the, the federal government is evaluating three of uh, possible fighter jets to buy. This is the Saab Gripen and um, the Boeing Super Hornet and the Lockheed Martin F-35. 
And so uh, we know that most likely the Canadian government is going to buy the F-35. This is a technically flawed plane. It's extremely expensive. It's extremely carbon intensive. It's extremely loud. It's about 15 times louder than the current fighter jets. And so we've been working really hard this past year. We've had actions in front of our members of Parliament's office. Uh, we've, we've had fast uh, hunger strikes. Um, we have been doing so many different actions to try to raise uh, public awareness and to put public pressure on the government to not buy these fighter jets. So, um, you know, we welcome your support from the United States to not buy uh, new fighter jets. And um, yeah, we know that they'll be used in, um, in, in wars overseas that, you know, kill and destroy things, kill, kill people and destroy things. And uh, this is not right. And we really need to stop this. So um, we need everybody to help us. Uh, we need everybody to help us in this campaign. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Well, I uh, just wanted to make a comment. Oh, okay, so, <laughs> okay. All right, I want to listen to someone else. Thank you. Um, hey. we have Oh, yeah. uh, I was just going to say, maybe it's Brent, and maybe if I could just respond quickly to, to, to Paul, um, to his question. Just to say, I mean, I think the, 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 the peace movement, the anti-militarism movement in this country has some work to do to connect with um, Indigenous movements, Indigenous land defenders, um, to be able to... to, to um, move some of this work forward. And I think this evening is a really terrific example of, of the beginnings of that work. So again, I'd really like to, to, to express gratitude to the, to the organizers uh, for this evening. And maybe just quickly to, to mention what I've observed in terms of Indigenous resistance to um, climate change or to, to, to mega projects in this country, because maybe it gives us a little bit of something to think about in terms of the of the war planes. That one, there's been um, a, a definite focus on on divestment strategies. So looking at at the banks or the insurance companies that are that are funding um, funding these sort of extractivist projects. And so again, maybe in terms of the war industry or the 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 um, the purchase of the fighter jets, we can look at some of the financialization issues, and then secondly, um, it's really been about land reoccupation and being on the land and blocking, you know, a pipeline from going through or a housing pro um, housing subdevelopment that lacks consent. And so again, I think for the peace movement, for the anti-war movement in this country, to think about that in terms of the military bases and 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 how we work together and and learn from from other movements but i just wanted to add that in and thank paul for his uh question thank you very much thank you everyone thank you everyone <laughs> i have some ideas myself that i can pursue here thank you uh we had a question from uh mary jorgensen is that her if she wanted to And, yeah, I wanted to let everyone know about a good development. It was a previous speaker spoke about how um, the Chinese influence, I think he didn't mention Greenland, but I believe it, it was in it, the defenders of the uh, jet plane purchase were trying to maintain that. China had influence over Greenland and through its rare earth mining project. And that Greenland would eventually go into the Chinese sphere of influence. Well, just two weeks ago, the supporters of this rare earth mine in Greenland, they were booted out of the government in an election. The uh, people that won the election were the uh, Green Party and the Inuit and now the Inuit are totally opposed to what the Chinese were trying to do in the past and which were used by the people that were trying to justify the, the jet planes. So, you know, 
Russia's far away and, you know, Greenland is still part of, uh, you know, Denmark and they're not about to be a Chinese base. So I think that should be used to say this is no, you know, sensible reason to have these jet planes. And the reason that was trying to be used in the past is now past. Thank you, John. John has his PhD in thank, history. Thank, thank. He does. He He's a good man. Yeah. He really thank is. You. Thank you. Thank you. If uh, there's no more comments, I would like to invite back uh, Elizabeth Penashu to do a close, any closing words that offer to us. And then we will go into our um, amazing dance party that I welcome my, uh, my good friend, DJ uh, Keisha, um, that she will take us into the night after Elizabeth. So welcome again, Elizabeth, to end the night. Thank you. I'm not sure she'll understand. Elizabeth? Okay, okay Elizabeth. Is there anything more you would like to share with us, Elizabeth? Anything more you would like to say before we get, say goodbye? Okay, I just want to say thank you very much, everybody. And uh, it's a very, very important this evening, the people talking is very, very important the story and in, and then it's this true story yeah. not lie true story that's what happened that's what happened Labrador. the government she should listen to people we speak to the people and the children you know people always hunting always hunting and everything on the ground medicine berries animals everything is very very important the government you should listen to people and respect the people and the children everybody Absolutely. thank you very very much thank you elizabeth ciao quest thank you yeah thank you welcome um now goodbye everyone and i hope you can stay for the our dance party um, now I will hand it over to my amazing uh, DJ friend, Keish. <laughs>